The Great Turkey Walk, Chapter 9 It was a joyous meeting of the flocks the next morning. My birds acted like they was genuinely delighted to see each other again, especially the lost toms, the way they was strutting and fanning their fine feathers to catch the attentions of their admiring hens. Mr. Peace had done up a glorious breakfast, too. While the birds socialized and we gorged, more plans were worked out. I figure we can make it to Versailles sometime tomorrow, Simon, Mr. Peace said. That there's the biggest town we're likely to come across before Denver, outside of Independence. Might be wise to top up our supplies with a little of Cleaver's money. Those coins were clanking around in my pockets. Had been all morning on the short haul to main camp. Work up a list, Mr. Peace. I might have a few things to add to it. I knew right off what was chief among that list, too. Watching Jabeth do his scarecrow imitation to one side of the small flock this morning had settled his main problem in my mind. It had to do with his feet. There he was, kind of mincing hither and yon, flapping like usual. Jabeth, I said. Yes, Simon. How is it you don't walk funny like that except when you're working the birds? He stopped cold in his tracks. A hangdog expression spread over his face. Don't like to mention something so silly, Simon. Spit it out, Jabeth. You're among friends. Well, his head was still drooping, nearly down to his splayed bare toes. I'm learning to love your turkeys better every day, Simon. Truly, I am. But, I pushed him along. But, and then he finally spit it out. Fast. But I hate like blazes to have to squish through fresh turkey dropping, Simon. So, that was it. It didn't take me no time at all to grasp the situation. Before you know it, I'm slapping my knees, roaring. <laughs> Near to rolling in them identical droppings. Jabeth, he didn't see the humor of it the way I did. You got boots, Simon. I caught myself long enough to stare down my body. So I did. Yet I chuckled on and off the last half mile to Mr. Peace's breakfast anyhow and kept on chuckling through the meal. The next day, we left the flock just outside Versailles with Mr. Peace and Emmett. Jabeth and I headed past the outlying wheat fields into town, still being in slave territory, though not north of the Mississippi River in Little Dixie where most of the owners lived. Jabeth hunched into his toad-eating act and started treating me with his master nonsense again. He shuffled a few steps behind me. He bowed and scraped. It grated, but as it was for his long-term good, I put up with it. After perambulating the town, we settled on the biggest general store, where Jabeth trailed me inside. I guess we didn't look that flush because nobody paid us any mind. I cleared my throat a few times to no effect. Then I started in losing patience. I raised my voice a little. Need to look at some boots. At last, the storekeeper glanced up from his ledger books and down to my feet. For you? Don't know as we stock them that big. Nope, for my boy here. A look of scorn passed across the man's face. Ain't got slave grade here. Don't want slave grade. Want a good solid pair of boots so's I won't have to be reshodding him for a long while. He perked up. If that's the case, poor Jabeth had some time getting fitted. First off, I had to buy him socks so his black feet wouldn't contaminate the stock. Then he hobbled around in half a dozen pair, looking like maybe the boot idea was a poor one to begin with. I finally bent over to where he was prodding at a toe cap. Ain't you ever had boots before, Jabeth? I whispered. Never. He tossed back, and I'm beginning to wonder if they's worth all the fuss, master. Watch your tongue, boy, I said in a louder tone, else you won't get that new shirt I promised. New shirt? That sparked up Jabeth considerable. 
He hobbled around a little more. Think these'll do fine, Master, sir. Just need to break them in. We left our grocery order piled on the floor, ready to fetch when we walked the flock through town the next morning. What we carried out was Jabus' old rags, done up in a parcel as if it were the finest silk cloth. That shopkeeper had finally stood up and saluted to the color of my money. As for Jabeth, he was sporting new togs from top to bottom and inside out, with extra drawers and even an extra shirt for when the first batch got too stiff with dirt to wear. I'd bought me a few extras on that account, too. Uncle Lucas hadn't exactly set me loose from the farm in style. I'd also invested in a new Bowie knife to replace the one on permanent loan to Jabeth, besides a tin plate, a cup, and a blanket to complete Jabez's kit. The final purchase pleased me mightily. It was a spanking new slouch hat for Mr. Peace. We started to walk back to the turkeys in high spirits. A barber shop stopped me in my tracks. I took a look at Jabez's halo of tight curls, then felt the length of my own thatch. One more stop, Jabez. I sank into the barber's chair first. I had never been in one before. Ain't Maybelle always having done the honors with her mixing bowl and sewing scissors. It was a novelty having a towel slung around my shoulders and the barber standing there stropping his razors. What'll it be, he asked. Wash, cut, and shave? I felt my roughened cheeks and grinned. Why not? Mr. Peace liked to faint it when he saw the two of us strutting back into camp. What in tarnation? What you fellas gone and done to yourselves? I turned full before him. Hadn't recognized myself either when that Versailles barber dusted me all down with sweet-smelling talc and held a little mirror to my face. A new and different Simon Green had stared back at me. I swore off mixing bowl haircuts then and there for the rest of my life. How about Jabeth here, Mr. Peace? I'd twirl my friend for good measure. Jabeth? He hadn't needed the shave, and the cut took about three inches off his height, but I thought he ended up right handsome in the process. Between that and the new duds that didn't flap, of course. Approve of the effect, Mr. Peace? Think I'll just go hide out with the mules, the Skinner answered. Ain't nobody gonna give me a second look next to you two blades. I think they might at that, I said, and pulled his new hat from behind my back. What's this? Mr. Peace reached for the present, then dropped his fingers. Ain't it time, Mr. Peace? You've been looking for a new life, haven't you? Seems to me as if a new hat fits right in with a new life. He finally accepted my present. He fingered the clean black felt for a long moment. At last, he swung off the old hat and clapped on the new. Man don't need a drink any more when he's got friends as good as you, Simon was all he said. Then he was off to the mules. The next few days we made good time through more wheat country to the village of Coal Camp where we swung north along what Mr. Peace said was the last section of dirt road for a ways. Mr. Peace knew his roads from his droving days along the Santa Fe Trail and afterward taking wagons on shorter hauls around Missouri. That 20-mile stretch due north was a nice piece to travel on account of it following the spring fork, which gave the birds all the water they wanted. It was truly amazing how much a turkey could drink. They was pretty good about trotting along most of the day, but when they decided it was time to stop, they wanted plenty to drink, then plenty to eat before settling down for the night. We got to talking about exactly how much they could drink one evening around the campfire. Well, Mr. Peace considered, Strikes me that a medium bird could down a couple quarts of water a day easy. More, Jabeth threw in. Three quarts. End of the day, you're always attending to the four-legged animals, Mr. Peace, sir. I don't think you pay that much mind to the turkeys. Do too, Mr. Peace said that like he'd been insulted. I'd have to go along with Jabeth on this one, Mr. Peace. I tossed a skeleton of a trout from my plate into the fire and reached into the fry pan for another helping of Jabez's catch. I'd go as high as a gallon myself. That got Mr. Peace's ire up. A gallon. We hit Sedalia tomorrow, where the road ends, and we head due west again. 
you be willing to put out a few coins for a little testing device? What sort of testing device? Jabeth interrupted. I don't see how a person can measure what a turkey drinks, no how. A very simple device, Mr. Peace grinned, and not a total waste of funds either, as it'll have long-term uses for all of us, man and beast alike. Come on, Mr. Peace. He got me wondering now. What exactly is it you've got in mind? But Mr. Peace only grinned some more and turned in for the night. So the next morning, we set off with a little more vigor and anticipation in our steps than usual. Jabeth and I, we was mighty curious about what Bidwell Peace was holding up his sleeve. But when we finally got to Sedalia, Mr. Peace just stretched out his hand, palm up. I dropped a coin into it, and he disappeared into the one and only store. Meanwhile, there was Jabeth and Emmett and me and the birds clogging the dusty little road through town. Naturally, we roused some interest from the local folks. All of them seemed like. They stood around gaping, but said nothing until my drover emerged again, his hands full. Why, that's nothing but a ten-gallon copper wash pot, Mr. Peace. Correct, Simon. Like my mama did all the laundry in, Jabeth added. Yep, Mr. Peace verified. What you boys figure is the key part of that description you just give me? Well, Jabeth and I both scratched our heads over that one. Jabez spoke up first. The ten-gallon part? Get that boy a cigar, Mr. Peace cackled, and he cackled like a madman all the way to the town pump. There he commenced to fill the tub with water, right up to the very brim. Then he waved us over. Clear little space between the birds, Jabeth. You haul this to the space, Simon. Mind you don't spill a drop. I followed his direction, shaking my head the entire time. Had that spanking new hat done something to Mr. Peace's brain power? The villagers came closer, surrounding us. One of the men finally spoke. You fellas got a little bet going on here? Looks like a bet to me. Another man shot out a spurt of tobacco juice. If it be a proper bet, like to get in on it. Ain't been no action around here in a coon's age. Mr. Peace trotted front and center, eyes twinkling. Certainly, gentlemen. You're all welcome to partake of our little wager. A nickel will get you in, but let me explain first. This, he waved at the tub, this is a ten-gallon copper wash tub. You all agreed on that? Solemn head nodding began. Right, and it's filled to the very brim with water. Fresh, pure spring water from your very own fine village well. Ten gallons of it. More nods. Next, Mr. Peace pointed toward my flock. Those are turkeys. Nearly 1,000 of the finest top-notch bronze turkeys. Our wager is simple. We're just trying to figure out how much a hale and hearty turkey can drink in a sitting. My estimate is two quarts each. My associates, he pointed at Jabeth and me, they figure three quarts and one gallon, respectively. Got all that? More nodding and a little head scratching from the crowd, which had expanded even more by this time. The bartender from the saloon on the far side of the street must have lost his customers cause he dragged out a table and set a few bottles and glasses onto it. Then he went back to haul out a couple of chairs. How you gonna prove it? A broad bearded gentleman finally asked. Mr. Peace smiled. Simple, my good sir. We set 10 turkeys to the tub. We let them drink their fill. Then we see what's left. Closest bets to the three estimates share the pot. I'm in, the first nickel got tossed onto the ground, for two quarts. Me too, another nickel followed, starting a second pile, for three quarts. I'm betting with that big fella. My head jerked up at the new voice. It was a lady placing the bet. She was leaning out the open window over the saloon. She tossed a coin down to me. Here you go, big boy. I caught it. A whole quarter, ma'am? I put my money on winners. She laughed 
and so did the bartender and other gentlemen who were now heading for the bottle. I carefully started a third pile, then stared at Mr. Peace. Who'd have thought he had this whole project in him? Why, he could teach a few things to Cleaver, the coconut man. I stepped over to Jabeth. Guess we better catch ten birds. I leaned a little closer. And make them big ones, Jabeth. Turned out Jabeth and I didn't have to do all the work. Those locals, they joined in the game with glee. Pretty soon there was Jabeth and me kneeling in the dirt just outside the rim of the full tub, holding a fat tom each. Eight of the men was each hanging on to a bird, too. The turkeys already smelled the water and had their necks stretched. Bright red wattles convulsing in anticipation. Above us, Mr. Peace was grinning to beat the band. Now I'm about to count to three, he said. On the count of three, I swoops off my hat. That's when you all set loose the birds. We waited. The crowd edging around us did too. One. Mr. Peace was having the time of his life. Two. He was stretching it for all it was worth. Three. Off swooped the new hat with a flourish. Down plopped the birds, panting for the water. I got to my feet and backed off a ways, but not too far. So did everyone else. But we're standing there in silence under the hot sun, nobody saying anything for fear of putting the turkeys off their drinks. After a while, you could see the difference in the tub's water level. That water was noticeably disappearing by the inch. My birds didn't stop. They leaned over the rim, brown legs and claws stretched tense behind them. They just kept on dipping their beaks into the coolness and guzzling the liquid down their long throats. When the water got below the halfway mark, Jabeth poked me. I never knowed watching turkeys could be so interesting. I glanced around at the men, the lady above the saloon, the rest of the village. It was as if the whole place was under some kind of spell. The remainder of my flock, too. They was straining their necks, waddles and snoods throbbing, eyes cocked toward the tub, trying to figure out what was happening. I smiled. Finally, there came a long sigh from everyone. Then a great cheer. Those ten turkeys was waddling away from the tub, bloated. They just up and left. I walked closer and peeked in. Wasn't hardly a drop of water left. They drunk it all. Woo-wee! I yelled. I was right! That makes a good gallon each! There was some back slapping followed by the division of the pot. That lady over the saloon had done all right, after all. I did, too. I made enough in the wager to pay for the original tub. It hadn't been a bad investment, after all. Way better than playing around with coconut shells. I turned to Mr. Peace. He was standing there, rubbing his chin. Well, Mr. Peace? Well, Simon, he answered. I was just figuring on whether the turkeys could go for more water. After all, if we was to set five birds to the ten gallons, I gave my drover a friendly shove. One time is fun, Mr. Peace. I'm not pressing after our luck or our birds. Then I grinned so he'd know I was overall pleased with him. And I'm not sure exactly how I feel about traveling with a gambling man. Mr. Peace, he only cackled a final time. Then he clapped his new hat atop his head. Let's move out the turkeys, boys, before they roost in the middle of Sedalia's main street. End of chapter 9